you know, now Bill Samuels Jr. was used to going to events and meeting his consumer and they loved him. It was a love fest. So from Bill's perspective, anecdotally, there was this just this sea of admirers and loyalists. Well, we go do this study and I was the one that had to stand in a meeting and tell him that his best drinker on average drank more Jack Daniels than Maker's Mark. He about threw me out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of Bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. Understanding how the bourbon geek thinks, it's been something that has dumbfounded and perplexed us for years. We talk about all the time on roundtables and different episodes where we try to guess why consumers purchase in various and certain ways. And for the longest time, you all have asked us, why don't you get somebody on the show that can talk about the psychology of a bourbon drinker? Well, ask and you shall receive. In this very special episode, Jim White, who's the founder and president of Reality Check Consulting, who also has a background in bourbon advertising and psychology, joins the show to talk about how people think and how brands can develop a story. This episode will dive into the psychology of scarcity, pricing, limited editions, repeat purchases, and just so much more. And during different segments, you're going to come away realizing a reason why you chase and hunt bottles as well. With that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Tom Wazanuski, and I hope I got that right, who writes me on fredminnick.com. For your Above the Char segment, don't know if you've answered this before, I have a question about the bottle and bond regulation and enforcement. Does the government place a revenuer in each distilling plant to oversee the process, or is the distiller on the honor system to ensure the bottled and bond requirements are met? That is a great question, Tom. And there used to be a federal agent who was on the grounds pretty much at all times, focusing on just that, making sure that what the distillers said that they were doing was was legit. Like they weren't making mistakes like, oh, we accidentally dumped rye and bourbon together. So now we have a whole new product. That didn't happen because they had oversight of a federal agent. And let's be very clear here. The distilling industry looked at those people as allies. They were like their friends and they kind of they kind of helped them prevent making mistakes. And they also kept out a lot of the marketing mess that we see today. Now, I've talked about this in past episodes and I have I've done YouTubes about this before, but I, I won't go too much down that path on the, on the marketing side. When you look at Bottled and Bond today, it's actually kind of a paperwork trail, but there's not really anybody there that is eyeballing it. But the TTB does send agents. They do follow closely the paperwork. So they will review the paperwork and make sure the right dumps are there and they'll kind of look at the like the barrel report and everything. But there there could be room for shenanigans. There's been a few things that have kind of slipped through the cracks, but for the most part everyone's everyone's honest. And just in general, the federal government doesn't have the budget to oversee things in the distilling business. So the distilleries end up signing things like self-perjury documents when they get a federal approval for a label. They do all these things, and, and a lot of the onus is on the distillers for, for the honor code. But when they get caught doing something like having an incorrect proof or paying not paying the proper taxes, they do get themselves in, in pretty big trouble. They'll, they'll get significant fines. People have lost their jobs. I can't think of anybody in the distilling side that's faced jail time for something like that, but I don't think that would be out of the realm of possibility if it was really egregious. But great question, but no, there's not anybody, there's not a federal revenue or on site making sure that they are following the letter of the law. Should there be? Eh, probably not anymore. The cat's out of the bag. We, there's, we, we can't go back to how things were in 1978, even though it would be good for whiskey. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. If you want to be like Tom, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button. And if I like the idea, I'll read it on the air. Till next week. Cheers.
From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Welcome back, everybody. It's another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. I'm Kenny. I'm Ryan. Fred Minnick here. There we go. And the whole team is here to talk about something that's a very interesting. I mean, it's a topic that we have always tried to figure out amongst ourselves and we can't do it as much as we want to try to pin down and saying like, what makes people want to drive towards this particular brand or what makes this attractive and trying to just get into the psyche of a bourbon buyer is it's been something that maybe it's changed over the past few years, but it's a constant evolution of trying to figure out what the hell are people actually wanting nowadays? Yeah, a lot of self-evaluation because we are bourbon buyers and, you know, we're always curious what makes us tick, but also what makes other people tick because you look at something you're like, I don't understand why why people are gravitating towards that or, you know, it's just bourbons is fascinating. You know, we talk about all the time on roundtables or conversations amongst ourselves, just like it's just this fascinating thing where the the psyche just seems different from any other, like, yes you know, enthusiast hobby, you know, if you look at food or coffee or anything, it's like bourbon's definitely consumers got a different mindset when it comes to how they make purchases and whatnot. Yeah. I'll be fascinated to like get into the subject of like, how is it brands like Mike Drop and Blanton's somehow appeal to the bro dude market and, you know, a really incredible brand, you know, that's craft made, doesn't even penetrate that and they can't get any like shelf space in a major liquor store. It's it's fascinating to me because it's, I get blamed a lot, you know, when I like something. (laughs) Yeah, you do. (laughs) And, and it's like, I'm kind of curious, like, you know, I don't think it's, I think it's more than just me, obviously, but I mean, it's like, why do people chase these FOMO moments? And it's with a handful of brands, Blanton's being at the top of them. And I'm fascinated to, to learn why people choose a brand that, you know, is is so much over SRP at a liquor store 
over something like four rows of single barrel. I got to know. I want to know. And that's we're going to get dive into it. So that is why we brought an expert on the show today. So today on the show, we have Jim White. He is the founder and president of Reality Check Consulting. So Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to get our reality check today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'll do what I can. What is, what is reality? <laughs> <laughs> is this real? <laughs> so I guess before we dive into it, kind of give a little bit of background about how you kind of got into the role that you were in. You were kind of mentioned before we started, you worked at Doe Anderson at one point as well, which yeah, yeah. anybody that's maybe if you're new to bourbon, you don't know, like that's the people behind every single maker's mark advertisement that's ever existed. Yeah, so all that great the best stuff. ever. Yeah. It's the, literally the best ever. Yeah. So yeah, I got into this in the advertising business. I was doing market research, but for ad agencies and from Kentucky originally, I lived in Chicago for a brief bit in the early part of my career, but then came back to work at Doe. And at that time, this was late 90s, early 2000s, one of Doe's biggest clients was Maker's Mark, and that was when Bill Samuels Jr. was still at the helm. So we had a lot of fun working on that brand, but I learned a, a ton about bourbon drinkers doing market research, focus groups, surveys, trying to understand what made them tick so we could create some ads that connected with them in some way. Well, you, you did a good job, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many others that uh, Fred and I were talking earlier. He mentioned Jim Lindsay. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, Jim and Bill Samuels Jr. really created the the feel uh, and sort of the brand essence of Maker's Mark early, early on with some great campaigns. We were just trying not to mess that up, I think, you know, when I, when I came along. Then I left Doe Anderson 2001-ish and started Reality Check. We've done a, quite a bit of work over the years in alcoholic beverages, a lot in the beer space. So AB and Bev and Constellation, we do work with New Belgium now, which is Voodoo Ranger, fun brands like that. So we continue to talk uh, to consumers all over the place about alcoholic beverages and why they drink what they drink and how they make brand choices. I don't have all of the answers to the questions you guys are asking, but we can, we can <laughs> we certainly can, kick it around a yeah. little bit, you know? Well, I guess give, give a little bit more about information about what Reality Check does from that perspective of trying to get information from consumers and stuff like that. Yeah, we like to say our clients have questions and we try to go find them answers. That's basically it. And those questions are usually, who should we be targeting with our brand? What kind of message is going to resonate with them? What motivates them to choose us versus the other guys? And then we'll get into very specific stuff like testing different advertising concepts, testing package designs to help our clients promote their brand in the marketplace. That's gotcha. basically what we do. And we, most of the methods, the research methods that we use come out of psychology and anthropology. So we're trying to get inside the black box to understand what people are doing. We'll dive into that a little bit. What are some of those research methods that you are, you're introducing? Yeah, so we do quite a bit of just really deep interviews with consumers. So I think I was telling you guys, can't talk a lot about it. A lot of this is proprietary, but we did do a project for the Van Winkles last year, which was fascinating. We were talking to bourbon drinkers. So in, in that a study like that, we'll do 30 or 40 in-depth interviews. So we'll be spending an hour, an hour and a half with one person, talk about how they perceive the category, how they perceive different brands, why they choose what they choose, and really sort of what it means to them as a human being in the world and how they use that brand, not just for physiological benefits, like I really like it because it tastes good, but more into what you were talking about, Ryan, about identity, what it, it helps them represent symbolically about who they are in the world. So a lot of in-depth interviews, but then we'll do quite a bit of larger projects, large scale survey research and that kind of stuff. How do you select candidates? That would be going through there. I mean, when you think of somebody that like, we'll just take your Van Winkle project for yeah, as an example, yeah. it's like, I mean, any one of us three sitting around here would probably be a good candidate for that. But how are you searching those candidates? Yeah. So we'll work with companies that maintain big databases of consumers across the country and we'll give them specifications. We're looking for North American whiskey drinkers who, who are aware of or drink these brands and we'll give them a specific list. And we might ask them for certain demographic characteristics, regionality, what have you. I think one of the interesting things that we saw with that Van Winkle project is just how, in my perception, the face of bourbon has changed. You know, I think previously, 20, 30 years ago, bourbon was, you know, older southeastern white guys like me. <laughs> you know, now if you look at the face of the bourbon consumer, it's, it's hugely diverse. All age groups, all ethnicities gender diverse. And, you know, the people that we talked to in this research were highly knowledgeable and they knew their stuff. They knew their brands. 
You know, it's just interesting to see how bourbon has evolved and the typical bourbon drinker is now not what you would expect, I guess, based on the history and heritage of, of the spirit and where it came from. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you talked about you use psychology and whatnot. And I think a lot of, it is fascinating that there's a lot of like, I guess, primal, like auto systems in our, our psyche and our body that have been there for you know, thousands of years that people may not realize that that, you know, makes them make decisions without even thinking about it. People think they're kind of in control. You know, I make decisions myself, but there's these systems that we have that kind of help guide our decision making. Can you talk about some of the like psychology and what things that you think trigger a customer to like navigate towards brands or this or that or some a market or yeah, sure. I mean, you know, one of the things that I want to point out is is that bourbon, and you hit on this, Ryan, a minute ago. I mean, bourbon is a very deep drink. You know, I think it's it's deeper than a lot of other categories in alcoholic beverage space, beer, vodka, certainly. I know Fred would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we used to joke, you get a, a table full of bourbon drinkers in a focus group, and it's easier to bring that group of consumers to tears than it is when you're talking about something like healthcare or banking or money, which you think like would be the more serious categories because you get a group of people around the table when you're talking about bourbon, pretty quickly you realize you're not talking about bourbon anymore. You're talking about relationships. You're talking about deep bonds with other people. You're talking about their fathers. You know, There have been many, many instances where I've had guys tear up in groups talking about bourbon. It's connected to their history of maturity and how they were raised and who introduced them to the spirit in the first place. But I think beyond that, we like to think of brands as narrative devices. Basically, the simple way of thinking about it is, is we use a lot of brands in our lives as human beings to help tell ourselves stories about who we are. So brands are deeply rooted in identity. And I think bourbon brands, particularly right now, speak to certain aspects of our identity that are kind of deep human motivations. One of those is a need for status. You know, Fred, you were asking about a brand that sells way above its MSRP, why does that happen? Well, it happens because of that. That if you're able to access a brand that's scarce or rare or expensive, it says something about who you are, not only to other people in the world, but you're trying to reaffirm a story about who you are to yourself, that I have access others might not have, or I have knowledge that others might not have, or I have money that others might not have. So I think the, the drive for status is one of the reasons why you see the scarcity craze, people losing their minds over brands that, you know, as a taster, you might say, well, this is no better than anything else. It's got very little to do with how it actually tastes. In fact, I would say most even premium bourbon drinkers don't know really how to taste bourbon. I don't. <laughs> but it's about other things. It's about deeper motivations than that. You mentioned Pappy Van Winkle, and I've always found this fascinating with Pappy Van Winkle and like Weller's. You know, Weller used to be at Rite Aid. I could get it all the time. No one cared about it. You know, it was there for 20, 30 bucks. But then all of a sudden the shift changed, and now it's like a shelf trophy. And like, can you walk us through that? How does a brand go for 80 years, no one caring about it, and then all of a sudden just people go gaga over it? Yeah, I, I you guys have talked about this, and I didn't realize the history of of what Buffalo Trace has done in creating scarcity. But that's, you know, strategically, it, it turned out to be a smart move, and they've done that effectively with a number of their brands. But it is, you know, that realization that I can get access to something that others can't get access to that makes me feel like I've got some sort of inside baseball knowledge of a category or, or what have you. You know, the reason why all this started happening, I'm not really sure. You know, if you go back, and I think that's part of the irony, if you think about where bourbon was 30, 40 years ago as a spirit, what it represented was actually the whole category was bottom shelf. And we were talking about Maker's Mark and, and Bill Samuels, and I think one of the the brilliance of what Maker's was able to do is is what used to be an oxymoron, which was create a premium bourbon brand. Well, that didn't really exist back in the 80s or 70s, and they were able to do it, and that was one of the first, and then you saw Woodford come along and uh, actually leapfrog makers in that space, and then all the super premiums started to hit. What's interesting about that time frame is the quality of the whiskey was there. It was just how it was presented. You know, it, yeah. was, it, was, never, it was never marketed to 
I hate to use this category because, but it, you, you get an idea of who they are: doctors and people on Wall Street. It was always marketed to blue collar workers. Yeah, super premium is the word itself is a marketing word. The whiskey from that time frame was probably five times better than today, just on how it was made, barrel entry proof. You know, the corn you know, being pre hybrid stuff like that, but. The way that they approach, you know, the way they make makers mark approach marketing and how they their campaigns like, what was it? It tastes expensive. It is, yeah, or something that like that. Was one of the ads, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was that was huge. I mean, that that helped change the game and the packaging changed the game. It still would be kind of a relatively. It was an anomaly in in the seventies and eighties. You still had Wild Turkey, Evan Williams, kind of pushing through is like value propositions. Jim Beam the same. And then Jack Daniels all the while appealing to the rockers and musicians and kind of like building a whole party scene. But the 90s is when that the the true like super premium, the whiskey started rising up with it. And you mentioned Woodford Reserve, but that next step would be the limited edition line that we would see from Jim Beam, from Buffalo Trace. And that was the time frame when you had left Doe Anderson that the world really started changing with how whiskey was marketed. And they went from focusing on mainstays to creating that a limited edition offering. Talk a little bit about the psychology from a brand of why it's important to create limited edition offerings instead of just mainstays. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's what I was talking about earlier, that the psychology behind it is is about status. It's about having either access to or knowledge of something that not everybody can get. And you're trying to reflect that to yourself as well as to, to other people. You know, when I was working on Maker's Mark, a lot of really smart people created the ambassador program. And that was one of the first attempts, I think, to recognize, okay, Maker's has this sea of loyalists out there. Can we activate these people and can we can we reward them for being loyalists to the brand? So the ambassador program was all about giving this group of consumers the feeling that they had unique access to the brand that others don't have. So you join the ambassador program, you got a business card with your name on it that said you're an ambassador, you got your name on a barrel at the distillery. Get some wax coasters. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Something that comes in the mail every Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something comes, yeah, with a little scarf. All of that kind of stuff was was meant to to make people feel like they had access to the brand that not everybody did. It's a, it was, it's a status play. You know, you talk about where bourbon used to be and what it used to represent, I think, to folks, more blue collar, more bottom shelf as a category. I can remember when we first saw the Woodford Reserve package. Now, they were a competitor to us. And I remember thinking, man, that's brilliant. Because what Woodford did so well, and I think this continues to be something, maybe you guys could learn something from this I, I, for your own brand. I, I think that there's a need now to balance the ruggedness of bourbon, the masculinity of it, which it's always had, with the refinement and sophistication that it now has. And when I saw the Woodford package, I thought, man, that's brilliant. It's an elegant flask. So they've taken a flask, which harkens back to the foundations of bourbon as a category, but they've put it in etched glass. It's beautiful. It looks great on the back bar. So they, I feel like they hit all the right notes in sending those cues that bourbon still maintains its ruggedness that we know it for, that sort of American individualism, you know, that blue collar ethic and sensibility, but we're stepping it up. We're, we're pushing it into sophistication connoisseurship and these things. That's when I knew Oh boy, these guys are for real and they're coming at us. <laughs> yeah. Well, they were just they were created intentionally to get Maker's Mark off of Jack Daniels. Yep. With all those like ad campaigns that you all did with like finding the guy named Jack Daniel in Mississippi and dressing him up and saying like, "Hey everybody, look, Jack Daniels drinks Maker's Mark." You know, that's uh, one of my favorite stories. Yeah, it, yeah, and in those days, I mean, that was, you know, again, going back to consumer research, we used to do focus groups and we do what we call a, a, a table sort. And we'd, we'd put 20 bottles of different North American whiskey brands on the table and we'd say, okay, sort these any way you see fit. And what we were doing is having consumers create a perceptual map on the conference room table. 
And, you know, back in the day, nine times out of 10, they would start that sort with Jack Daniels. It sort of defined the category and they would take Jack and they put it in the middle of the table and then everything got referenced off of that. So Maker's Mark and Crown Royal would go above Jack Daniels, you know, Beam, Turkey would go either even with or slightly below and they would create this table arrangement. Mm -hmm. But then you see in the late 90s and early 2000s, these other brands coming along that were leapfrogging and creating really a new space that was above Crown and Maker's and those brands that had been the the you know the premium bourbon space up until that time yeah it's interesting you you know we're kind of even we're kind of like uh, peeling away at like the the growth of bourbon in a lot of ways of the the 80s would be the 80s and 90s would be bourbon's growth super premium 1.0 the limited edition series being 2.0 and now we're in a we're in that between the 3.0 or we're like bourbon has come back I'm about 4.0 and now we're at we're at a point where consumers will will buy things on for the last 10 years they, they will buy things on the secondary market or they will spend you know well over well over SRP and i understand it's a status thing but there seems to be like an obsession like like a different level of obsession to the point where i kid you not they'll max out credit cards and put themselves in debt buying product and even to the point of you know this coming up in their divorces like I've known people whose whose spouses divorced them in part because of their bourbon obsession. Is there another consumer beyond the person who is looking for that status connection that is will cling on to anything and just focus, 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 focus on it? And we, obviously we're talking about bourbon, but it could be watches, it could be cars, but is there another type of consumer out there? Yeah, I, I think that, it's a small group. I mean, I, I think that when you're looking at the the premium bourbon drinkers that are really driving the bulk of what's going on these days, that that are coming to the bourbon trail and doing the tours, and they may be, you know, minor collectors, but they're drinkers, you know, first and foremost. I think that's the primary group here. I think what you're talking about, Fred, is probably a real tip of the spear. But whether you call it connoisseurship or, you know, kind of a collector phenomenon, I think it still is about status at its core. And I think some people get carried away with that. But that's typically we get interested in the consumers that are really driving volume. You know, the brands that can hire us are interested in those people that are, you know, they're, they're bigger volume brands. I mean, Pappy's a bit of an exception to that. But, you know, they're, they're interested in the larger population of, of, of bourbon drinkers. Yeah. How do you, I guess, how do you approach, you know, you talked about scarcity status, this, but as a volume play, you really can't play that. So how do you, as a brand, if you're wanting to create volume, how do you market that differently? And what, or I guess, I guess you're asking this hypothetically. Well, <laughs> hypothetically, uh, If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon. The farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase. 
and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're wanting to create volume, how do you market that differently and what I guess, I guess you're asking this hypothetically. Well, <laughs> hypothetically, uh, well, because it, it, you know, and you, you brought up packaging. How yeah. you know, packaging bourbon to me, you still look at the shelves, and it's very, you know, a lot of text, a lot of stories, a lot of old dead guys, you know, ruggedness, you know. And there's a few outliers that have like this kind of a modern approach, but they're not really moving the volume that you know these old legacy brands. So like. I hear you saying like you need to kind of make it sleek and aesthetic, but that's not what's, you know, appealing to the mass consumer, I guess. So I guess maybe talk about the difference of what appeals to a mass consumer versus like a, a scarcity niche limited edition focused consumer. Yeah. Well, a couple things on that. I mean, the brands that are super scarce, like a Pappy, they're still able to offer an experience to the mass mass market. I mean, we're talking about mass market. We're still talking about premium bourbon drinkers. I mean, it's not a huge category. It's it's the higher end of that. But there are ways that you can experience a brand like Pappy through the merchandise, through, you know, buying drink on premise. And those create shareable moments. And I think that's another important thing to understand about bourbon and what's driving, I think, the the appeal of it right now. And in many ways, it's kind of the opposite of the status thing that I was talking about. It's a, it's about belonging. And I think that a lot of bourbon drinkers see membership into a community. They're connecting with other people around bourbon. Listening to podcasts like you guys is an important part of that. It's a shared experience. So if you're able to have a glass of Pappy at a bar somewhere, or you go to a friend's house and they happen to have a bottle, or maybe, you know, like my son, who's not even a bourbon drinker, he's college senior, he's drinking Natty Light, I think, more often than oh, anything else. God. <laughs> you know, but he's, before, it's but okay. he's got a Pappy Van Winkle hat. And for him, he goes to school out of state. So for him, that's it's symbolizing his connection to Kentucky, to his heritage, to where he's from, to other people. So, you know, part of this is belonging to a, a community of appreciators, of other bourbon drinkers, sharing those experiences with them, interacting with them, feeling like you're part of something. So on the one hand, I think a lot of the the FOMO that you guys were talking about around super premium bourbons and scarcity, it's in part driven by individualism and wanting to stand apart and wanting to, to feel like I have status in the world, but it's also driven by almost the opposite of that, where I wanna feel like I belong to a group of people that share maybe my values, share my interests certainly, share some knowledge base, the ability to know something about these brands. And then the other thing to your question about how do you how do you extend a brand experience beyond just the juice, so to speak? I, I think that's the reason why you see so many brands now trying to become lifestyle brands, trying to to sell an experience. Yeah, Pappy certainly if, if they the forefront it, there with with Pappy Co. Yep, you know, yeah, I mean they're. You know, it, I mean, you uh, mean a Natty Light Co. is what we need. So we get a <laughs> oh boy, Natty Light hat, right, right. <laughs> you know what? I I would go. I would go for an old vintage uh, Natty Light hoodie. I'm sure it's on, it's on eBay. It's got. Yeah, be. you know, it's a it's a cool. I had some experience with Natty Light in college. I regret them. Yeah, but we all, yeah. But I think even like you know what you see Bardstown Urban Company doing with the kitchen, and you see what the dance are doing at Dan Crossing. I mean, all of those are attempts to you know, grow a brand experience beyond just what's in the bottle. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. I, I understand that a lot, but there's still, there's still like this, like if we narrow it down to the individual, like, and the individual who is going into a store and they absolutely know four rows of single barrel is delicious and every bit as good or better than that $200 bottle in that shelf, like, or behind there. Is, is it solely because they want to be ostentatious and look good in front of their friends that they will go and buy the $200 bottle? Is that really it? Is it I, that simple? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit different than that in a way, yeah. But what I think is interesting is that that individual consumer is going to see that bottle on their bar many more times than their friends will. 
And I think that what psychologists would say is, yeah, it's you're, you're signaling something to those friends that, that come in. But more often than not, you're signaling something to yourself. You know, it, it's, it's sending a cue to yourself about your own status and who you are. It might be a cue about, I have specialized knowledge, like I know this is really good, or it could be, I had the money to buy this. But I think oftentimes we subscribe to a theory in psychology called narrative identity. And basically what psychologists would tell you is that we construct our sense of who we are in the world through a story that we're an internal story we kind of tell ourselves. So imagine you've got this continually running movie in your head and you're the director, you're the screenwriter, you're the star all rolled into one. And we're trying to do things to make that story of who we are in the world align with our aspirations, who we want to be, how we want to see ourselves. And we use brands to help sort of round out those stories. So having a brand like that on my shelf, you know, it's certainly signals something to the people that come over and visit. But I think more importantly, we're, it, it's, it's filling in the narrative gap for us. We're looking at it saying, hey, I'm this kind of guy. All right, let's take it to another level. Let's say <laughs> the three of us, the three of us, we all know that what's behind that locked cage, we know it's okay in comparison to that. But it's at SRP and it's not like heavily marked up. Like if I see Blanton's at SRP, I have fully admitted I, I may buy it. If I see Henry McKenna at SRP, I'm definitely buying it. So what is it? And this is this is where we're having therapy here now at this point. <laughs> but what is it about like someone like us? We know that this whiskey is is okay in comparison to Four Rows of Single Barrel, but we buy it anyway just because we can. We we rarely see it at that price, so we still we still we get it. Like what is what is that? Because that's not status. I'm not. I don't need that. I just. You, you it, kind of took another question that I was going to line up, which is yeah. which is kind of like the same thing when I said like, why would somebody purchase something that they've already had? Oh yeah, you know it's like yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. we've had it before. What right. like you just said, I'd go buy Blanton's, but why why are you buying it? You've already had it, and and, yeah. and I guess that kind of that's why it's like what makes you want to continue to yeah, keep buying I mean, the same thing that I you've think, already had over it, and over again. Yeah, it's important to understand that it's not just about the taste experience. You know, that's one benefit. There's a physiological benefit. And really, it's not just about taste. I mean, bourbon compared to other spirits has a very distinct physiological effect. You know, if you ask consumers to describe how do you feel, how does it feel when bourbon enters your body? And they'll start talking about warmth. They'll still start talking about sort of intimacy and connection, you know. Uh, bourbon, bourbon, oh. yeah, bourbon moments. Some bow, chicka, wow, well, come up after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, unfortunately oh. not. Uh, but, you know, I, most of the times when bourbon drinkers talk about bourbon moments, they're, they're oftentimes either alone or they're in small groups of really close friends. Meaningful relationships, intimate connections, very different than a vodka experience or a Natty Light experience, right? right. Those are all, or a Voodoo Ranger experience, you know, another brand that we work on. These beverages and brands, they represent and have strong symbols to, you know, our kind of rituals and routines that we have in our lives. Physiologically, though, it's also very different, the taste experience of bourbon, the physical experience of it than those other drinks. It's, you know, vodka oftentimes gets described as being very sort of cleansing among vodka drinkers. Bourbon, on the other hand, is very sort of warming in that sense. But I think it goes beyond taste. And the reason why you'd re-up for something that you've had before is because the brand represents more than just that moment in time taste experience. It's a symbol and it could be a symbol of, you know, something that's inaccessible or scarce. It could be a symbol of something, you know, this is the brand that I, I, my parents drank when I was growing up. So there's nostalgia to it and that's why I buy it. And I constantly wrap. It's a million different reasons, but it's bigger than just the, that one moment in time taste experience. Yeah. I, the reason I thought about it is because like you'll see somebody and they've got 10 different Eagle Rares stacked across their shelf. I'm like, well, there's so much stuff that you could choose from. Oh, Why would you choose the same thing over and over? I've got a buddy that hoards Eagle Rare. I mean, he's got a closet full and I guess he feels like it's there's going to be a day. You know, it's like toilet paper during the pandemic. Yeah. He feels like it's, <laughs> it's going to be a day when I can't get it. So I yeah. better stock up on it. That's common. One thing I learned to point out about your all's experience, though, is is your knowledge base and your awareness of these brands and your experience with them is 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 atypical compared to the average premium bourbon drinker. Mm -hmm. And one other thing in terms of the psychology of brand choice that's important to understand here is that 
the more complex this category becomes, the more you know pursuit spirits there are in the world. These brands keep coming out constantly. It seems like every day there's a new brand. Yeah, the more there is. the the more complexity. Yeah, right. The more complexity you have in any category, the more the consumer has to use what we would call simplification strategies to make choices. What a psychologist would call a heuristic. It's a shortcut to deal with complexity, so you don't feel overwhelmed. So all of these consumers, I don't care how well or how knowledgeable they are about the category, they're all looking for some way to manage the category. So I'm glad you mentioned McKenna. So when Fred mentions McKenna, you know, a few years ago, and the world goes crazy for McKenna and you can't get it all of a sudden, well, that's a heuristic. So Fred's a, a thought leader. A lot of people follow him. He mentions a brand. And that has real weight. You guys have real influence because people are using you to simplify a complex category. We see this in all kinds of categories. Bourbon didn't used to be this way. The choices used to be simple. Well, now it's like, good Lord, how do I, how do I sift through all of this? So, and then another powerful heuristic is price. It simply is price and scarcity. If you see something that costs a lot and it's really hard to get, it's very hard to convince yourself anything other than, wow, it must be really good, you know? So those kind of things really drive a lot of choice. Now, most consumers aren't willing to admit that, but it operates on all of us. We, we live in a complex world and we have to simplify our choices in some way. Well, all yeah. you have to do is go to our comment section on any video <laughs> uh, or Facebook post and they'll tell you everything, you know, because they're all experts. Everyone in bourbon has, has some type of level of expert expertism when it comes to consumer habits in this wor world and and also when the bubble's going to bust you know <laughs> yeah and, and speaking of that do you have any like when in this high level in-depth access to consumers and their brains and just knowing habits in general do you get a feel for the larger picture for for uh the bourbon industry is it you kind of talked about a little bit like a lot of brands coming out is, is that an indication of growth or is that does it make it harder for consumers? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it definitely makes it harder for consumers, I think. As far as when the bubble is going to burst, I have no idea. I, I, if you would have asked me, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when this was just starting to take off, I would have said it would have burst long before now, but it just seems to keep picking up steam. And now with the advent of bourbon tourism and the way these brands are expanding into experiential dimensions... Your guess is as good as mine, guys. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know how long this will be going on, you know, ride it while you can. But I think it, it will eventually begin to hit a, a curve because uh, all, all brands, I think, go from, or not all brands, but all categories kind of go through this cycle. At some point, it will be replaced with something to some degree. Do uh, other categories have legions of fans who want it, want it to fail? Like there's a large group of people in bourbon who want the, bur the the bubble to bust because they think that means that the pricing will go down. They'll be able to get access to Pappy like they did in 95. Yeah, boy, uh, that's a great question. I, You know, I've never encountered a category where detractors are wanting the category to fail. Certainly you can find detractors of any brands or, you know, for any, any brand that's higher priced, you're going to find people out there who say it's not worth it you know, followers of that brand are being taken to the cleaners. But I've never seen that happen in a category, but it's interesting. <laughs> it, that's its own. I, I tell you, like the bourbon consumer would be an incredible study for a psychologist uh, in terms of their spending habits and like, and their beliefs and all that. Cause we've all seen this, right? Every single year, like, Oh, this is, this is it. The bourbons jumped the shark. I mean, it's been, yep. they've been saying that since 2008. As soon as podcasters got into it, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so another question I had was, you kind of talked about people and the brands, like, is the idea of brand loyalty kind of dead in the bourbon world? Like when you're interviewing people and just trying to figure out, like, what are they gravitating towards? I don't know. I mean, I feel like we keep preaching the days of like going in and replenishing your bottle of Maker's Mark. It's kind of over when you look at the sea of bottles and you have so many choices but then on the, the counteract of that is like, okay, now I've got my friend that has 10 bottles of Eagle Rare on the shelf and he keeps buying the same thing. So where do you kind of see like the devise of like, is brand loyalty still there versus the consumers that just want to keep trying new stuff? The neophytes, if you will. 
Yeah, it, it's hard for me to say if loyalty is dead in bourbon, but definitely when you see a proliferation of brands like this and, you know, coupled with a trend toward connoisseurship, you know, there is an interest in people trying new things, which ultimately I think is is, is great for the industry and great for the category. But for any individual brand, it, it can spell a little bit of trouble. So shopping around is something that you can expect when you see this many brands out there. It doesn't mean, though, that, you know, the average consumer doesn't have their favorite. Going back to the Pappy study, which is the most recent we've done in this category, all of those consumers we talked to had their go-to bourbon. And I do. I don't know. I think you guys probably do or have a, a short list of those that you always kind of come back 30. to. 30. <laughs> <laughs> Got a short list of 30. Yeah, yeah. I, I can remember... This is way back when, when I first started working on Maker's Mark in the late 90s, we did a quantitative study, so big sample study on Maker's Mark. And it was the first time the brand had done anything like that. You know, now Bill Samuels Jr. was used to going to events and meeting his consumer, and they loved him. It was a love fest. So from Bill's perspective, anecdotally, there was this just this sea of admirers and loyalists. Well, we go do this study. And I was the one that had to stand in a meeting and tell him that his best drinker, on average, drank more Jack Daniels than Maker's Mark. He about threw me out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> but I explained that in those days, you know, Maker's was the premium, Jack was the base. And so, yeah, on an average night, your consumer's drinking Jack Daniels. On a special night, they're drinking Maker's Mark. So your volume is going to be less with these people, but the occasions are more deeply seated. And my guess is for that consumer, Jack may have been more vulnerable as a brand and makers actually commanded more loyalty. But loyalty doesn't necessarily mean somebody's going to buy you every time. It just means there's a bond there. And there's a, mm -hmm. like I was talking about narrative identity. I mean, I, I think that where you want to be as a brand is to play a role in someone's life story. And if you can play that role, then you've got a deep connection with that consumer and you're never going to go away. Do you know how many bourbon drinkers there are in the category in the U.S.? Like just a... Don't boy, I do not. Okay. I was just curious. <laughs> and I, well, and I, I guess this leads to my question because you talked about that, you know, us three are like so far deep into it. We're not like the average consumer, but I guess an average consumer of bourbon, you know, it probably buys maybe what five to six bottles a year you know and they're and that they, they might be they're probably gonna be the same but they might have some differences I'm, I'm just looking at my friends bars you know they have like five to ten bottles but they seem to be like you know from the big six distilleries you know how do you i guess because they go with what's comfortable but yeah i mean wh why are they choosing those and what how do you get someone that's not that nerd or in deep how do you get someone to like realize to start exploring or and it's such an interesting category because all your sales have to happen in a liquor store for the most part and you know that's why you see a lot of brands put a lot of money into case stacks or displays or this or that so uh, I, I know I'm, this is like a loaded run-on question but i guess with the all the sea of new brands but you have these six distilleries that make up 75 percent of the purchases it seems like how do you i guess attract them to like look beyond what's safe it's really really hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean safety is an interesting concept and i think when i was talking before about simplification strategies and heuristics that's the, it's the same thing i mean you know people want to buy brands that you know nobody's going to look at them sideways for or at least if they're buying a niche brand something someone else hasn't been made aware of there's a story behind it there's there's a rationale that they can give that other person of let me tell you about this brand and i think that that's the best thing you can do is as a new brand is help through your packaging through your marketing through your podcast <laughs> whatever it might be help seed that story in people's minds you know i think the distillery tour phenomenon is an important piece of marketing because if you're able to provide access to your brand, even in a small scale through a tour, you've got that consumer for an hour to tell your story, to give them those kind of interesting bits, to give them those little simple stories that they can then share with other people and say, oh, you've never heard of this. Well, let me tell you about it. And that's going back in the day. That's what we were trying to do with Maker's Mark with the ambassador program. 
It was to give those consumers a couple of stories about the brand's history and heritage that they could then share with others. You know, and, and it's interesting now, you know, Makers has always represented that kind of elevated status to me. I have a young employee, she's a bourbon fanatic, and her perception of Maker's Mark is totally different than mine. Why is that? Because she's 28 years old. She's used to walking into a liquor store and seeing a thousand facings of Maker's Mark on the shelf. Well, that doesn't seem special. That doesn't seem scarce to her at all. To her, Maker's is sort of eh, disregarded. I'd know? say that's probably the majority I, of yeah. the It's now the... It would now be the base, yep. you know, versus the super premium. And they've got super premiums, but that it wouldn't be considered that anymore for sure. Yeah. But if you can see that story, Ryan, I mean, that's that's what you have to do. The problem is, is you've got a host of other brands trying to do the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that gets back to the complexity the category has created for the consumer. They're trying to navigate this and it's hard, you know. Where's the it's better really place to try to stand out? Because I see a lot of people trying to do stuff on social media. Everyone's trying to appeal there. They do online retail, try to, or liquor stores, which can be complicated. They want a little uh, green back to go with placement in the store sometimes. So for for these guys, I'm not affiliated with their brand, but what what's the best place for them to focus to stand out, to build those kind of... Or not for us, just... In, in general. <laughs> yeah, in just general. in general. Because I think, well, because... Because it also helps you understand, his, him talking about this also helps you understand where the pool of bourbon consumers are more, more likely. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's less a matter of where and more a matter of with whom. And, and I think that nothing does a small brand greater service than word of mouth. And if there are influential people in the bourbon community talking about a brand, I mean, I listen to you guys for that reason. I want to hear what you're talking about because I, even though I grew up and I've worked in the category, I can't keep track of it all. I can't drink it all. And I don't know how to taste whiskey. I mean, if you lined up, you know, a bunch of weeded bourbons here in front of me, including Pappy, I probably couldn't tell you which one the Pappy was. So I rely on... Makes you feel any better. I bet you 50% of the people we pull probably couldn't either. <laughs> right, yeah, but right. there's that yeah. drive that people yeah. wanted anyway. So if if you can get not just, you know, at, at shelf, if you can get that bourbon expert at Party Mart to say, hey, you should try this, or that bartender, or that person on social media, that critic, that podcaster, to talk about your brand, that goes a long way. You know, because again, people are just looking for a reason. They're looking for a story. Help me understand why this brand is something I should try. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess uh, one thing that Fred had brought up at the very beginning is is kind of talk about, and I don't know if this everyone on the Pappy study, the idea of FOMO, the fear of missing out and how that really drives the consumer as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think it goes back to where we started. It, it's about the scarcity and about the status. You know, one of the interesting things that we did learn in the Pappy study was just what we ended up calling the thrill of the hunt, that there's a benefit that people derive just from learning about new bottles coming out, new releases, regardless of whether they even are able to acquire a bottle, but just engaging in that conversation. And they might be doing it through social media. They might be doing it through a, you know, a group chat with a bunch of friends or people that they hang out with. But there's an appreciation that consumers can get about brands just from talking about them and being knowledgeable about, hey, did you hear this is coming out? You know, I think we saw some of that with the Maker's 12-year-old cast strength release. Just knowing about that and being able to talk about it, regardless of whether people actually could secure a bottle or not. Yeah. You know, so I, I think it's the FOMO applies not just to being able to get your hands on stuff, but it also applies to being the first to know or feeling like you're in the know about certain things. You know, I, I think that you know, particularly if you're engaged in this category at that kind of high level, that connoisseurship level, you're driven to want to know the latest news and information as much as getting that rare bottle. And I guess one more question to kind of throw at you talk about people like getting bottles, the people that have 10 bottles we could wear on the shelf and, and the idea of like a hoarding mentality of when you get into this and you buy, 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 buy. 
is there something that drives a person to say like, okay, well, I'm just going to go ham and try everything and buy everything versus somebody that's going to be, as you said, like the average consumer that only maybe buys five or six bottles a year. Like what is like, how, how do you define those two people and, and what drives somebody to really kind of push to like <laughs> the brink of like marital divorce? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think there is a psychology of collecting, which, frankly, I don't know that much about, but I'm sure that that underpins a lot of that kind of behavior. But I would say, just based on what we know about the the category and and you know the questions you guys are asking about, when will this end? I think that you know people that are really into this and also that are interested in brands that you can't always find. You know, when they are able to find them, they want to stock up and, uh, you know, pantry load, bar load, I guess you would call it, for free or that this may be the last shot I have to get a bottle of Eagle Rare. So I know I got 10 others, you know, sitting in the bottom of my closet, but I'm going to pick up the 11th right now because who knows when it's, there's going to be no more, yeah. you know? So there's a little FOMO to that as well. But I, I think that, that that scarcity drives a lot of this kind of behavior. Better get it while it's here or else it might not might not have another opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. When does that scarcity play run out? It's like once you can find it in this and that, you stop buying it because there's so much there. There's enough out there that that scarcity mentality kind of runs out. So I guess as a brand, you have to play that balance like, oh, I want to grow, but I don't want demand. to. I don't want to out exceed that demand, you know, that the, the scarcity role is playing. So there's like this. I guess conflicting interest as a brand, like as you're 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 trying to scale, you don't want that scarcity play to what else can you rely on, I guess, to to keep that momentum going. Yeah. And that's a that's a little bit of a sticky wicket, I think. And we're getting more into brand strategy now than consumer psychology, but well, there's some consumer psychology to it. I think that, you know, you can run the risk of angering a consumer base if they get the sense that you're creating scarcity. It hasn't happened yet in this yeah, category. It doesn't that. seem like. <laughs> I think Buffalo <laughs> Trace has got some anger. Do you think so? Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's kind of the anger too. Like I hate him. I'm still standing in line to go well, get a bottle. Right, yeah, right. You, know. <laughs> you, like, you still pick up a bottle of Blanton's if yeah. you see it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a fine line to tread. You know, I mean, I can remember the decision for makers to take the price up, and there was some backlash about that years ago. You know, those kind of decisions, you're always going to have some Proof consumer. Proof one. Was, yeah, that was yeah, even. Right. That was huge. Yeah. yeah. Huge. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's a, it can get you into trouble, I think, if consumers get the, the sense that the scarcity is manufactured and not because of demand is through the roof and we just can't keep up with it. It can cut the, uh, the opposite way. Jim, this has been fantastic. Boys, any more questions? No. No. No, All right. not not for public consumption anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Yeah. They, well, I hope I was able to shed a little bit of light. I uh, think so. No, absolutely. I think this has been a, a great insight into the studies and everything that you've done because this is one of the things we we sit around and we try to ask ourselves these questions like why would people do this? Like and maybe it's because we are years, decades into this hobby and this and we're make trying to make a, a profession out of it, I guess you could say. So we we analyze things so much mm -hmm. but maybe we forget about it could be as simple as scarcity as status and as just having something that nobody else has yeah i think the status one really caught me like it just the the level of that i think that really caught me by i mean I, to be fair it's like we all know we all know yeah blanton's is a pretty mediocre bourbon it's not bad it's not great, but it's right there in the middle. Yeah. But there is a status symbol to it of actually mm -hmm. having that on your shelf. Mm -hmm. And that's why people will still wait in lines. That's why some people will still claim they're like, oh, it's my favorite bourbon, but they've never tried it against a blind. And it is, I think it's just a feeling of status. You know, there's been a lot of things that contribute to it. And whether it is scarcity, whether it's because it's in John Wick or whatever kind of film of the moment, I mean, there is yeah. a lot of things that contribute to it. But this has all been one of the things that, you know, Jim has kind of like shed that light on of, of being able to understand what is the consumer really thinking? Because as the one percent of people that are into bourbon listen to the show, we forget about everybody else out there. It's just a, a passive consumer and sort of like how they treat, especially when we get out of the, the limited edition chasers, but into the the general populace as well. Simplification. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So Jim, simple, like stupid. Said, yeah. I want to say thank you again for coming on the show. Well, thank you guys. It's been a blast. Yeah. If people want to get in touch with you, say like, hey, I've got a brand. I want to do a study. How do they do it? Yeah. Just shoot me an email. It's uh, realitycheckinc.com is our website. You can go on there and reach me that way. Awesome. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, again, Jim, thank you for coming on the show today. It was great to kind of get into the insight of all the studies that you've done. It's just been fantastic. And so make sure you check them out. Make sure you check us out, bourbonpursuit.com. There's all the other episodes that we've ever done. You can go ahead and we have other roundtables where we've asked one question and that took up an entire hour of trying to figure out how we get into the mind of a bourbon drinker. So go and check out all our past episodes there. Also follow Bourbon Pursuit, share with a friend, and tell them it's the best podcast ever that they can't get until they open up their app, their app right? <laughs> so create that scarcity somehow. That's right. The word of mouth. Yes, yes. But with that, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next time. Okay, sucks. Doodles. Doodles.